be looking to the pure horror titles, rather the spoopy games. Games that include horrific elements, but are generally more bright toned and fun. These include, but are not limited to, creatively grisly graphics, a harebrained story that gives you just the right amount of goosebumps, and just the overall ability to use bright elements to disguise the horrifying elements, or at least distract you from them. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, pumpkin scream in the dead of night. Dead Rising was originally released on the Xbox 360 and soon became a hot seller for the console. Gamers loved exploring the zombie-filled mall while mowing down hundreds of zombies with everything and the kitchen sink. Literally. Though it did have some issues with friendly AI that was dumber than the zombies or the bland but hammy storyline, it was still a very good game which was successful enough to give us a sequel. And how was that? <laughs> Dead Rising 2 was everything a sequel should be, taking everything great about the previous game, amplifying it, and fixing any issues the previous game had. Now, not only could you use anything you got your hands on as a weapon, but you could also combine some of them into amazing, hilarious combinations of destruction. The game truly embraced the B-movie vibe that the first game gave off. Every weapon you create was more outrageous than the last. An electric guitar that rocks your enemy's head off, a toy helicopter with machete rotors, or how about an electric wheelchair with mounted machine guns and a robotic voice calling out taunts. Groovy. Silly weapons weren't the only thing that messed with the horror atmosphere of the game. A lot of the side characters, especially the psychopaths, were given much crazier designs and looks. How would you like to fight a Siegfried and Roy parody that starts off literally sawing a person in half? Or how about a crazed bobble-headed guy in a mascot costume who roller skates all over your face? I'm a brave boy. Not a brave enough boy for this! The game also had a spin-off version where you played as the first game's protagonist, Frank West. In that version, it became even campier with Frank spotting off one-liners even Duke Nukem would be impressed by. That guy kinda cracked me up. Shoulda saw that coming. That guy was a few screws short of a workbench. While the next game in the series would try to go a more serious route, Dead Rising 2 will remain one of the silliest zombie destruction fests of video game history. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to blow up some undead with a stick of dynamite attached to a bow and arrow. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, pumpkin scream in the dead of night. Ah, <sighs> LucasArts. Before they devolved into a corporate Borg zombie hybrid, they knew a thing or two about point and click adventure games, especially the ones with the spooky twist. One of their earliest, eeriest titles, Maniac Mansion. In this little number plucked from the gaming history books, a group of Saved by the Bell rejects are on a mission to rescue their friend from a mad scientist in his spooky mansion. Home to his freaky family, a living meteor from outer space, and sapient talking tentacles. Oh boy. Things are gonna get crazy! Right away, you can tell that this game is pretty much an homage slash parody to the cliches of the B-movie genre. What really makes it stand out is how it teeters between a cheesy, self-aware flick and a tense game that really puts you on the edge of your toes. In terms of the comedy, never even once does it take itself seriously. The characters, playable or NPC, are all zany and stereotypical, and they constantly play around with that. When it's not reveling in its own absurdity, the game's humor can get pretty dark at times. At one point, you have to distract Ed by shoving his beloved hamster in the microwave and baking it alive. In terms of gameplay, Maniac Mansion operates on a non-linear storyline, thus it really challenges your puzzle-solving capabilities. You play with three different characters out of seven, and the success of this mission depends on how well you utilize each individual character's unique skills. If you get caught or make any false moves, these characters can find themselves at a dead end. Heavy emphasis on dead. Yep, you only get one shot to get a puzzle right, otherwise you end up hitting a brick wall or... buried six feet under. No pressure or anything! Joking aside, I really gotta hand it to them for being able to balance absurd B-movie tackiness with genuinely terrifying gameplay with actual stakes. While the sequel, Day of the Tentacle, has a more direct storyline with more of the horrific elements toned down, it's still a bundle of bizarre fun. Fun fact, actually somewhere in the middle of the sequel, there's an easter egg that allows you to play its predecessor in full. So really, it's an accidental two-for-one deal. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, pumpkin scream in the dead of night. Oh no! Your house is haunted by ghosts, spooks, and specters! 
Who you gonna call? Really? This is the best we can find? <sighs> Dang it, YouTube! The Ghostbusters series is no stranger to video games. Ever since the movie's release in 1984, the franchise has had quite a few video game adaptations. Some that try and recreate the experience from the movie, and some which have their own story and are set within the Ghostbusters universe. This particular game takes place after the events of the second movie, where you play as The Rookie, a new Ghostbuster who gets his nickname because they don't want to grow too attached to you if you die testing all the experimental tech they have. Once you name it, you start getting attached to it. Throughout the game, you get to fight a plentiful bunch of specters and spooks of classic and new Ghostbusters tech. There's nothing quite as fun as watching a ghost panic when they realize they're about to be sucked into the ghost trap, or even your fellow Ghostbusters reactions when you hit them with the slime gun. The game nails the Ghostbusters vibe of we're trying to take this seriously, but we're having too much fun dealing with all this weirdness. The movie's always had that spoopy vibe, and the game is no different. You even get to fight previous enemies from the movie, such as the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, who, even in game, you really can't take too seriously. What really nails the comedy was that they were able to get the original cast back to voice act and even co-write for what is essentially a playable reunion, which is probably why it feels so much like the third film we never got. Ghostbusters the video game was a nice romp through the Ghostbusters universe, and honestly, it wasn't scary at all, unless you count the reboot they tried to pull off in 2016. Now that was terrifying. But not for the reasons you think. <laughs> this is Halloween, this is Halloween, and scream in the dead of night. Night in the Woods is a title that doesn't immediately present itself as a horror game. The first act mostly involves the main character, May, coming home to a more existential problem, more in line with a drama or comedy. However, as time passes, we slowly get to learn more about May's past and her own lingering mental issues, which eventually culminates into a plot that pays tribute to the cosmic horror of Lovecraft himself. Even going as far as to name drop the Black Goat, aka Shub Niggerath, a name that is so Lovecraft that I almost need to censor it. That said, despite the disturbing subject matter this game touches upon, such as mental illness, domestic abuse, and the finality of life itself, it does so with this playful charm. The animation on the characters with their noodle arms is expressive, yet minimalistic at the same time. The way May tackles a potentially life-threatening issue with the same level of enthusiasm that I eat mac and cheese with, it's nothing less than endearing. Even during the dream sequences, which directly connect with Possum Springs and its admittedly dark past, the grand jazzy music and imaginative animation going on around May only serve to change a scary oppressive atmosphere into a spooky whimsical one. In fact, Night in the Woods doesn't ramp up its spoopy part of the story until the third act. That's when everything comes together and it turns out that a cult of boomers screwed up and now need to sacrifice homeless people and kids who are too fond of skateboarding to a Lovecraftian horror. Even so, the entities are always masked behind either Shadow, which obscures what should be graphic violence, or cute cosmic cats. How fun! I mean, uh, woo, yeah, totally scared. Just remember, when you're at the end of everything, hold on to anything. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, scream in the dead of night. You think a tale about sentient bugs would be a horror title, and to some extent it is, but Hollow Knight lends itself more to the spoopy genre. Why? Because it never really dives that deep into the darkness. Sure, the world is dark and depressing, but it's never that in your face. There are no real jump scares or soul-chilling terror, unless you have a case of arachnophobia, but I digress. Hollow Knight is a tale about a small mute bug exploring a fallen kingdom. What is his goal? No one's sure, but as we dig through the ruins, we find hints as to how a once mighty civilization fell to dust and ash. All the while, we meet those who would stop our journey and those who help us on our way. Not unlike Dark Souls, the real selling point is the atmosphere and ambience of the world. Oh, and the music. Hollow Knight's soundtrack is wonderful, filled with somber tones, almost as if the music itself is weeping for the lost world. But even then, there are tracks that have a seed of hope within them, a quiet wish for the small bug you play as to restore the world to its former glory. Kinda makes you forget that not all bugs are whimsically endearing. In fact, a lot of them look like this. Good luck sleeping tonight. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, Pumpkin scream in the dead. This one. The creator of No More Heroes and the writer of the live action Scooby Doo movies walk into a bar. They make a horror game. You can probably see where this is going. 
Most zombie apocalypse stories have you fending for your life as hordes of zombies try to kill you. In Lollipop Chainsaw, you don't really have that. Here, you play as a flighty zombie hunting cheerleader named Juliet, prancing about killing zombies with a chainsaw. Go figure. But of course, this is Suda51 we're talking about. You're also killing them with martial arts, giant grass mowers, and special dancing. We'll let you paint the picture for this. With most spoopy games, there's still some serious tones to consider, as at its core, still a horror game. Well, not here. Nothing in this game is taken seriously. Even your sidekick slash boyfriend Nick tries to ground all of this, but you can't take him seriously because he's a disembodied head attached to your belt. Plus, when you're killing zombies, they all die with rainbow sparkles because why not? Weird zombies, insane killing methods, cursing galore, and weird innuendo humor? It's a Suda51 game through and through. Though, honestly, the weirdest part for me is that Juliet and Twilight Sparkle had the same voice actress, and Tara's using the Twilight Sparkle tone for Juliet. So hearing a renowned egghead speaking like an airhead... <laughs> You're like a kitten. A kitten that doesn't speak Japanese. Th that's weird. They're weird. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. Fucking scream in the dead of night. Picture this. It's the late 90s, and point-and-click adventure games are slowly declining. However, before they became the zombified halfling it is today, LucasArts decided to say farewell to the genre with this cinematic swan song, Grim Fandango. We play as Manny Calavera, a reaper on a four-year journey across the land of the dead, in hopes of finally leaving his dead-end afterlife behind to reach the great beyond. Along the way, he ends up uncovering some dirty dealings from the shadows, trying to cheat the system. On the brighter side of the spoopy spectrum, we can already see that the game's graphics are absolutely gorgeous. Most of the characters are either unique demonic figures or skeletons heavily inspired by the Calica scene during the Day of the Dead. Not only that, but the humor really hits on point, from the clever jokes like turning the Grim Reaper into a travel agent, to the more tongue-in-cheek jokes like an almost PG-13 scene turning into a drawn-out sob story. I never went to a single dance. Can you believe it? <laughs> I was in detention. Don't get me we wrong, the school. boys would ask, but I'd just run away. And just the comparison between the living and the dead. The land of the dead is a lot more lively, normal, and basically a perfect parallel of our world. The land of the living, however, is a nightmarish potpourri that Angela and the Conda puked up. And the less we remember about that show, the better! I think one of my favorite jokes is actually hidden in the game's manual. A little note from the creators that reads, Everybody in the game who smokes is dead. Think about it. I have never considered that in my entire life. Speaking of, that actually reminds me of the grimmer side of this title. It feels less like a game and more like a full-length film noir. While nothing really scary happens, there's still a little bit of morbid undertone to it all. The whole reason for Manny's journey is that he wants out of this world. Being trapped in basically the seventh terrace of Dante's Purgatorio feels like a prison to everyone, and they're all striving to continue on so they can finally rest in peace. Unfortunately, already being dead doesn't mean they're invincible. There is a way to kill what's already deceased. How? With a special chemical that painfully causes the victim to sprout flowers until absolutely nothing is left of them. They literally start pushing up daisies. <gasps> oh heavens, I just realized! Oh, come on, I no! A definite recommendation for Grim Fandango for being able to balance humor and realism in a Tim Burton meets Casablanca package. Plus, it says a lot when a game about the dead is a lot more lively than the company that made it. Hey, we should put that over the door. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, fucking scream in the dead of night. So if you're new to the channel, you might not know that I'm mostly immune to jump scares. Huh, you got me. Oh, I'm dead on it. Yep. <sighs> Should have checked for the breathing. I know I didn't. <laughs> Darn it. You then might be surprised to know that I enjoyed Spooky's House of Jump Scares. <clears throat> I mean, Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. The setup is simple. You're an aspiring historian exploring an old mansion when you come across the eponymous character. She challenges you to make it through the mansion, which is easier said than done. As you explore the mansion, things get increasingly deranged. You go from cutesy horror to legitimately terrifying imagery. Through it all though, the game manages to instill fear through that same deceptively innocent art style. Jim Sterling aptly described it as the cutest horror game ever made. 
Now, if only that subversion didn't happen so much, it became the norm. Are you all right? No, it's all good. It's fine. Wasn't wasn't planning on sleeping again for the rest of my life. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. Roguelikes and rhythm games. The two could not be more diametrically opposed. One is a genre focused on careful decision making where one wrong move can lead to a game over. The other is all about maintaining a perfect combo and flawless memorization. They shouldn't work together, but somehow they do. The gameplay of Crypta the Necrodancer requires you to perform actions to the beat of the music. Like with most rhythm games, you're rewarded for keeping a high combo. Because of this, you're required to make decisions on the fly in order to do well. And you won't. You will die a lot because this game is like playing Blitz Chess and Guitar Hero at the same time. Yes, the game is really, 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 really hard, but due to how fast paced the game is, you never get too frustrated. That's to say nothing of the soundtrack. It really takes the edge off when you inevitably die. Oh, shit. I'm, I'm still mad. This is Halloween, this is Halloween. Pumpkin scream in the dead of night. Sam and Max, The Devil's Playhouse. While the humor is definitely still there, it has a more unsettling cinematic feel with an air of mystery around the devil's toy box. Reading Blaster, ages 9 through 12. A cute little educational game with a freaky haunted house environment and a neat murder mystery plot, or disappearance plot in this case. 9 through 12. Pajama Salmon, no need to hide when it's dark outside. Living proof that early developed imaginations are trippy as heck. Grabbed by the Ghoulies, cartoonishly dark and beastly difficult. The real scary part is that Rare got bought by Microsoft. We've talked a lot about spoopy games this Halloween, and all of them should undice combo of scary themes and goofy antics. It's really hard to take most of them seriously, but that's kind of the point. And at number one, we have none other than Luigi's Mansion. And no, I didn't choose Luigi's Mansion just because the third game came out when this video was released. I mean, the timing helped. The premise alone is spoopiness incarnate. Luigi, our goofy eternal underdog, wins the contest and gets a mansion, shows up, it's haunted by ghosts, and Mario's missing. And unlike last time, forced education isn't the scariest thing here. For the rest of the game, Luigi goes around playing Ghostbuster with a vacuum, and each ghost is its own idea of insane. From a bodybuilder, creepy twins, the dog, toy soldiers, a pot ghost, and an artist that brings them all to life. For some of them, you're actually scared by, but then you realize it's the baby that's scaring you. For a while, you can take the game a bit more serious, then the boos show up and their really stupid names make you facepalm. You know you did after seeing Game Boo Advance. I can't look at you anymore. Whenever you hear that opening tone for the game, you know exactly what to expect. <laughs> It's the theme and the game that defines Spoopy, and Luigi is its hero. Keep fighting, little plumber, and don't trip over bananas. I'm the Fiery Joker, and if you'll excuse me, I gotta go do something scarier than all ten of these games combined. Marriage. Scream. See you in a moment! Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. And consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon or becoming a member and you'll get rewards like this. Our name shoutouts today are JTC Gaming and Misty Phantom. Our full sentence shoutout comes from Buzzsaw the Righteous, who says, Congrats to Josh and Ari on their up and coming wedding. May their future be filled with happiness, love, and cheesecake. Thanks for watching and supporting the show. Take care.